I just don't see a point in what? Supporting United? There is no point. Or at least big picture. You don't get to know what it is. Why he chased Ronaldo off and then double back two years later and decided he needs a winning player? Why Sancho didn't work out? Why Anthony is just, I don't know, Anthony? But you are not reassuring me, Bob Prophet. I can't reassure you. This idea that you have that you don't want to get the wrong coach again. It's childish, honestly, and it's cowardly. It stops you from experiencing things, including good things. Don't, don't you think I feel bad enough already? Ah, I know my club is shit. But you're supposed to tell me how we ended up here. You're supposed to give me a solution to this problem. Okay, fine. Let's talk about how Manchester United ended up here. And everything boils down to the very hard. To some Manchester United fans, he can do no wrong. I honestly don't understand how they can see that. Judging by the fact that this ball throw has been lying since day one. I'm not a Manchester United fan, but this is a rant. Look, I honestly don't understand why Tenaga and his cronies find it so hard to accept that he has made some mistakes or that his tactics just don't work sometimes. And when I say sometimes, I honestly really mean every time. This guy came in and said he wants Manchester United to be the best transition team in football. Okay, fine. A key component of being a team that plays in transition is to be good enough defensively to force turnovers during life play. But the squad just doesn't have players to play that way. In the forward line, the press is non-existent. The same press that this guy and a lot of United fans chased Ronaldo out the door for. I remember it just like yesterday. They said it was the problem. They said his goals were affecting the team. I honestly don't understand how a striker scoring goals is affecting the team. How do you let Jamie Carragher, a Liverpool player that obviously won't want the best for your club, turn you against your own club legend for sake? I don't want the best for you either, but at least I'm not affiliated with Liverpool. In midfield, Manchester United have Bruno, Meno, and Casemiro. They don't have top players to win area drills, which to be fair. To be fair though. To be fair though, what? To be fair though, what? Casemiro has won like 70% of his area draws in the Premier League since his debut. And when they do win the header, they are not fast enough to get to the second ball. <laughs> Pep Guardiola has a famous quote about second balls where he said, We have to cut down some of our mistakes, but the main thing in English football is controlling the second ball. Without that, you cannot survive. Mikel Ateta literally went into the transfer window with the intention of making his squad taller just to win area draws and second balls and it's paid off in the sheer amount of goals they've gotten from set pieces this season. But I guess Ten Hag skipped that part of Pep's school. And last of all, in terms of personnel, we have the defence. These guys can't keep a donkey out of a needle ball. Their defending is like the Old Trafford roofs. It's not skipping anything out. Unana's goal post has been a free for all throughout the season and it's been more chaotic than playing free for all on the shipment map. Manchester United are currently averaging 17.5 shots conceded per game, which puts them just above Sheffield United, a team that sits last in the actual table. And just to drive home the points and show you how far from the top United have been, they also concede almost 10 more shots than Arsenal and Manchester City. And yet, you still find people on Twitter after every match day defending his tactics and pushing the idea of Tenag being the right man for the job. And I know, you are probably saying, surely it's not that bad. Surely they would have something tangible to offer going forward. Right? Wrong. To be fair, they are not horrible going forward, but they are right in the middle of the park, behind Everton, Crystal Palace. Wait a minute, did you say Everton? Yes. Dykes Everton? Yes, they've been that bad. They've created an XG of 58.35 and have somehow managed to underperform that, scoring only 52 goals so far. Just five more than almost relegated Luton Town. What am I even saying? That's simply just horrible for a club of Manchester United's calibre. Ten Hag has spent 360 million improving this squad, bringing in players that he ultimately wanted. He brought in Oilun, and with every game that passes, I'm increasingly convinced that this guy was brought in solely because he has a similar name to Haaland. Because it definitely wasn't for his goals. I mean, the guy had 9 goals in the Serie A last season. 9! And Manchester United bought this guy for 65 million British pounds. And in case anyone forgot, Ten Hag chased the guy with the most goals in football history out the f***ing door because of his f***ing ego. I don't know how many goals Ronaldo would have scored if he was still in the squad. But we can all agree that you probably have more than Oilun and Rashford combined already. Don't get me wrong by the way, I have nothing against Oilun. 
he seems like a nice dude, he's a good footballer when he's at his level. But the problem is, his level is definitely not at the biggest club in England. But what about Mr. MB? He filled the Ronaldo gap last season with 30 goals and 10 assists. Well, boys and girls, that's an effect of the Manchester United non-title hangover. You see, over the last 10 years, I've noticed an irregular pattern in Manchester United performances. One year, they perform at the level they should be at realistically, which is between 5th and 10th position. But then the next year, sometimes as a result of the competition falling off, as a result of overperformance or new manager bounce, and sometimes it's a combination of all these reasons, they end up finishing in one of the top four spots and Manchester United forget the deficiencies of the squad only to be given a reality check the very next season. And nobody embodies that phenomenon better than Rashford this season. His production has fallen off a cliff. He just refuses to run or offer anything to the team play to justify being on the pitch when he's not scoring. And even then, it takes the board for 75% of the season to see a reason to drop him or try anything new. Anthony is... Anthony. Honestly, I'm not sure if that guy is really Brazilian. He's definitely from St. Kitts and Nevis or some wet country. I'm sorry to anyone that's from there by the way. How does an 100 million player have just one goal and assist over a full season? How? Hold on, bro. How? How you, I'm saying, how, like, talk to me, bro. When I watch Anthony play, he just comes across as a player that is not smart. And once again, I have nothing against him. But at this level of football, you can't be bringing a learning on the job vibe to the pitch every single game week. All his moves just seem like he's making things up as he goes. His movements are not efficient. His control is poor. His decision making is even worse. And it's easy to get away with making dumb decisions and having all these deficiencies in your game when you are in a league that's simply weaker than the Premier League. Anthony is always going to be Anthony. He was never a world class player or close to being world class. He's just suffering from Manchester United's poor business decisions. There's a twist trending about how Barcelona insiders are still surprised at how much Tottenham paid for Emerson. I'm telling you right now, that tweet should have been about the Anthony transfer. I asked bought this guy for just under 16 million in 2020 and sold him for 98 million euros two years later. Did Manchester United think they were buying a Nigerian prince? How did they get scammed so bad? They actually paid 60 million above market value to get a glorified Beyblade. And I'm sorry to say that because I try not to contribute to players getting bullied. But this time, it's just the truth. And Ten Hag isn't helping matters either. Aside from stupid decisions like helping Real Madrid offload yet another player that was surplus to requirements when he signed the 30-year-old Casemiro in a season where Madrid just signed his replacement. That replacement was Aurelien Chouameni, a player that is 8 years younger than Casem, a player that cost Real Madrid just 10 million more than the 70 million they got for the Casemiro transfer. But Manchester United and Ten Hag just couldn't do something as easy as signing a young star with incredible upside at the best opportunity possible. Nah. They like the tough challenges. I love the game. I love the hustle, man. They would rather go in one year later to try and sign him from Madrid. But get this, the foolishness doesn't stop there. He went ahead to spend exorbitant fees on positions that didn't seem pressing, signing Missing Mount, a player that just had one year left on his contract for £60 million, letting Golden Globe winning goalkeeper David De Gea leave on a free transfer and signing the replacements for £5 million under the guise of wanting a ball playing goalkeeper, a ball playing goalkeeper that somehow doesn't get to play to his strengths. Onana has launched the ball 195 times this season, more than double the number of times Ederson has had to launch the ball this season, more than West Ham goalkeeper Ariola and just a little less than Ben Leno. So what was the point of spending all that money on a position that wasn't of immediate importance? Even after all these transfers and questionable decisions that happened under his watch, Ten Hag still holds on to the argument that he doesn't have the players to play the kind of football he wants to play. What? It leaves me wondering what happened to the 360 million he already spent. This guy is a coach that can't help but be the main character. He's never wrong, everyone else is. I've never seen this fraud raise his hands after a bad game week and take responsibility for anything. His favorite go-to is to throw a player under the bus or point at Arsenal and Ateta as an excuse for his bad results. You could ask this guy what he had for breakfast and he would find a way to connect it to Arsenal. This season, you only need to look across the pond as Carlo Ancelotti and how he's handled the squad. That Real Madrid squad has a lot of big personalities and somehow, the vibes have always been immaculate. He handled the latter stages of Luka Modric's career extremely well while handling the start of Adagule's career wonderfully. 
For a player that has been one of the best players in the world, Modric was rightfully pissed that he wasn't starting enough games and he voiced out his frustration on multiple locations. Adagule was pissed because the club promised him he would get the opportunity to prove himself and not get sent on loan, which was precisely a big reason he signed in the first place. Fans were angry, calling Ancelotti all sorts of names for not giving Gule minutes because as fans, we stupidly think real life is like football manager or a FIFA career mode save where you can just restart the game if you make a mistake or lose. But like a good coach, Ancelotti acknowledged the frustrations of his players and did not try disrespecting them by cooking up bullshit reasons for leaving the Ballon d'Or winner on the bench. And for Goulet, he made it clear to both the fans and the players that he was employed to win matches and not just to give minutes to young players. It might have sounded harsh, especially to a neutral, but if you don't know, pro athletes have a really good BS detector. Sports are fundamentally about respecting the person opposite you. In 2024, the kids might call it glazing, but it's just common courtesy to respect a grown man like you and not lie in their face. Now, back to Mr. Egghead himself. One week ago, this guy complained about needing winning players in the squad. I have a question for you boys and girls. Who is the winningest player in football? The player that has his own persona built around his eight for losing. Surely not Ronaldo. The guy, man. He's literally the worst. Under Oli, the squad was definitely still ass. But at least, they had something of an identity. Can anyone please tell me what Manchester United's identity under Ten Hag has been so far? How do you spend all that money and somehow end up with a worse team than you had at the start? He somehow made every single player regress under his work. Casemiro looks like he should be on the next bus to Saudi. Bruno's best version is still somewhere in there, but he's very clearly not been at his best. Elon looks out of his depth, but it's hard to fully judge him when the rest of the team simply doesn't create enough chances to make critique in his place, something done in good faith. Saying all this, there is one thing I hate the most about Eric Ten Hag. And just so you don't forget, I already hated him. But the one thing I hate the most is that he just keeps whining. Oh my god, he f***ing never stops. One moment he's crying about how he doesn't have the players he needs. I don't understand how that is possible after spending 360 million already, but okay. The next time you see a quote of his press conference, he's talking about how injuries have affected the season. My brother in Christ, having injured players doesn't just make a team fall apart. Real Madrid are on the verge of winning their third trophy of the season in a year where they lost arguably the best goalkeeper in the world and they are starting CB pairing to season engine injuries. They had 30 plus separate injury cases. Vinicius was injured for about 3 months of the season. Bellingham played Hobwood for the last half of the season. But no matter who was on the pitch, they still played with an identity and it doesn't change if they have Adagule on the pitch or Fran Garcia. And I know people will run to the comments to say it's unfair to compare the depth of both teams. Of course, I know that. Like I said, the team has always been trash. But even a trash team can build an identity under a good coach. Key example, Burnley and Everton under Sean Dyche. They weren't what beaters or anything, but you knew what to expect from his Burnley team and his current Everton team anytime he tuned in. That's enough waffling for today. If you're a Manchester United fan, or even a neutral. Sit with yourself and think about what this team's identity is, what the idea behind the football they play is, and let me know in the comments. Do you think they should stay or be stacked at the end of the season? Remember to like and subscribe. I've got kids to feed. See you in the next video. Honestly, I think you know how. Stop waiting for Tenhag to save you. Face some cold hard facts. And possibly, maybe five years down the line, you could be a top club once again.